Wigovi, Ozempic, Monjaro. These GLP-1 and GIP agonist drugs have been making headlines lately. The celebrities are talking about it and they're using it for weight loss. Users have seen up to a 20% reduction in body fat. The drugs were originally developed to treat type 2 diabetes. They have been found to lower A1C, reduce cardiovascular events, and address kidney disease. This seemed revolutionary to me, and I needed to get to the bottom of it. Welcome to the show. I'm Justin. I have type 1 diabetes, and on here I talk all things diabetes tech, news, and management with providers, tech leaders, and those thriving with diabetes. I spoke with Diana Isaacs, a pharmacist and certified diabetes care and education specialist, who is an expert on how these drugs work and has prescribed them to her patients. She also co-hosts a podcast called Diabetes Dialogue, which I've linked in the show notes. Her and I get into how each of these drugs work, how the drugs are used for weight loss, people with type 2 diabetes, and off-label for type 1 diabetes. We also get into coverage, how expensive they are, and who insurance companies will cover. This Friday on YouTube, I'm releasing a second conversation Diana and I had on the history of GLP-1 agonists, future dual and triple agonist drugs, where coverage is headed, and the effect that all these drugs are having on the economy. Keep in mind that anything you hear on this podcast or content on any of my pages is not medical advice. Always consult with your physician before making changes to your healthcare. Today's episode is sponsored by T1D Exchange. You can directly make an impact on diabetes healthcare, treatments, and technology by participating in the T1D Exchange registry. It starts with a simple survey about your life with T1D, and it only takes about 15 minutes. After that, you'll have a personal portal with ongoing T1D study and survey opportunities. Plus, some of these studies even offer compensation. Signing up with the link in the show notes helps support my channel and it allows me to continue putting out free content. You can sign up at t1dexchange.org slash diabetic or click that link in today's show notes. Diana, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Of course. I'm glad this is this is happening. I've I've heard your name in the ether and we finally met. Can you kind of give us a little background just on what you do and your relationship to GLP ones? Yeah, sure. So I am a pharmacist. I'm also a certified diabetes care and education specialist. And even though I'm a pharmacist and a lot of times you might think a pharmacist is dispensing drugs, I work in an adult endocrinology clinic, actually a Cleveland clinic in Cleveland, Ohio. And in my role, I do have a scope of practice where I can prescribe medications. And so I am actually starting people on these GLP-1 drugs, as well as adjusting doses, you know, adjusting insulin. And I also, I love diabetes technology. So I am a big fan of using these with continuous glucose monitors and also other diabetes tech. But um, yeah, I'm excited to be here and I love all the videos you put out and everything. So yeah, thanks for having me and I'm looking forward to this discussion. Thank you. Yeah, and I know you have a podcast that's kind of geared toward healthcare providers, right? What do you talk about on there? Yeah, so I have a podcast called Diabetes Dialogue that I do with Natalie Bellini. She's a nurse practitioner and we it is geared toward healthcare professionals but also anyone who's interested in the topics but pretty much we talk about anything that is up and coming exciting new drug approvals new technology when a new insulin pump gets approved uh, a new study comes out we just like to talk about it and both of us work with patients like we spend most of our time in direct patient care so we feel like we have a lot of real world experience to share with people so it's really fun putting that out awesome So let's get into GLP-1s. First of all, can you explain to me what GLP-1, what what are they and what does it stand for? Yeah, so we use, we say GLP-1 because it's a lot easier to say than the full acronym. So GLP-1 stands for glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonist, which is really a mouthful. So that's why we just say GLP-1 agonist. It's a whole lot easier. And then there is now, with herzepatide, it is actually a dual GLP-1 
slash GIP receptor agonists. So it's basically affecting two of these molecules, two of these, we call them incretin hormones. And GIP stands for glucose-dependent insulinotropic polypeptide. <laughs> so we just say GIP. So that's what, that's what they stand for. Okay, so that, that was a little confusing, but I, I was able to pick <laughs> some of it up. But like, I guess, can you explain to us what these drugs at the root of it, what are they doing? Yeah. How do they work? So incretins are like, they're naturally produced in the body and we're really within the GI tract and they have a number of functions. So one of them is for example, that they actually help the body secrete more insulin, but they do so in a, a glucose dependent way. Meaning if you eat a meal, right? Your glucose is expected to go up and then this GLP causes your body to secrete insulin to help it to not go up so high. Also, one of the other things that happens is there's glucagon secretion to kind of keep the glucose level steady. But one of the things that happens, especially in type two diabetes, is there's just too much glucagon, which causes too many, too high glucose. And so this actually, it helps to suppress that and stop that. So it's just another way to keep the glucose levels steady. But also it slows gastric emptying, which is how we digest food. In doing that, it helps a person to feel more full, but it also slows how quickly the glucose is gonna rise after eating. And then it has even another mechanism where it just helps to promote satiety. It just helps to impact the brain and how you like your hunger cues and a lot of people with diabetes unfortunately the hunger cues are they're like people don't feel full when they should feel full and so because a lot of people with diabetes just don't have enough of these hormones and so these drugs are replacing the that hormones these incretins wow that that's so interesting it sounds like there really is like so many things at play with this drug which sounds like the reason for why it's it can be used for so many different things and and has benefits for you know a lot of different areas which we'll get, which we'll get into can you just kind of list off the the names of the the brands that people would know and i guess even tell us the the companies that are producing them what more recently has been the big game changers are semaglutide brand name is ozempic and there's also a weight loss formulation called wegovi that it's, I mean, that one's just in terms of how effective it is and the outcomes of it has really just exploded. And then the most recent one that we got is Mountjaro or Terzepatide. This is our only dual GLP-1 GIP receptor agonist. And uh, this one came out May 2022 and immediately like the uptake was really fast, not just by people, but also in the guidelines. We have these diabetes guidelines that clinicians follow and immediately that year it got adapted is pretty much like the highest level of effectiveness in terms of glucose lowering as well as weight loss. Okay, so let me get this right. Monjaro, trizepatide is like the genetic compound or it's... So like, it's what the generic name. They all have generic names and then they all have brand names. Okay, so what is the difference? Can you explain a little uh, more what the difference is between semaglutide, which is like the Wagovi Ozempic, right, versus the trizepatide, Manjaro? What, what, what's the difference between these two drugs? Yeah, so basically the, the semaglutide, I mean, they're both weekly drugs, so that's nice. They have long half-lives, just have to be taken once a week. But semaglutide is just the GLP-1 component versus trizepatide is the first time that we've had GLP-1 and GIP. And so, it, I mean, one of the hypotheses is that, well, you've got two of these incretins instead of just one. So in theory, you might have more of these effects that they have in terms of like the slowing gastric emptying, that promoting that feeling of fullness, the suppressing the glucagon and increasing the insulin, that you would have more of that. Also with GIP, there's, some speculation that it may impact insulin sensitivity more so. Um, and so it's really, there's a lot of research now being done because it's not just 
um, GLP-1 and even GIP. There's also glucagon receptor antagonists as well. And so there are these other incretins and the thought is the more of them we can impact that we could have even greater effects in terms of weight loss and glucose lowering. Wow. So it, is Manjaro like the next step from like the evolution of the Ozempic and um, and Wagovi? I, I mean, I think it is. It's where we're going for sure. Um, one of the things, because now, I mean, there's even like they're they're studying triple agonists. And I think like this is definitely the direction we're going what still we don't know is the cardiovascular outcomes of terzepatide. So with semaglutide, like that is very tried and true. It's been around a little bit longer and we, it's been studied, um, for example, with the cardiovascular outcomes with diabetes and then also the cardiovascular outcomes with obesity. And what's really remarkable is so in the select trial, that's the first time they did a cardiovascular outcome trial in people with overweight or obesity that had established cardiovascular disease and actually showed a 20% reduction in cardiovascular events. And this, by the way, just led to the approval of now Medicare saying that they would cover this drug for people, which is like unprecedented because in the past they did not cover weight loss drugs. So I think that's really remarkable. When it comes to terzepatide, because it just got the approval in 2022, and by the way, there's also a weight loss version which is also terzepatide, it's called ZepBound, that got approval late in 2023. And so we just, we are actually waiting for the cardiovascular outcome trials to be done. And I mean, we're all, I think we're all hoping and expecting they will be favorable, especially because in their trial, normally they compare to placebo, but in their trial, they went head to head with Trulicity, which is their own drug. So you would think they like, <laughs> they would feel confident they're going to be at least as good as that or better if they took that risk. But we still, we don't know until the data is out and presented, which will be later this year. So I think that's an important piece because we have had drugs in the past that led to weight loss and led to glucose lowering, but turned out to not be so safe. So we, that is of course really important that we have that cardiovascular safety. And I think this is top on people's mind because some people are like, when, when I hear people have concerns about GLP-1 agonists like semaglutide, at least I can say to them, well, look, like this has been studied. And in fact, this shows it reduces cardiovascular events. So not only is this safe, but this is like really good for you. So, yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. I, I want to clarify with FDA, I'm mean, sorry, uh, with Medicare, I believe Medicare still doesn't necessarily cover weight loss drugs, but it does. It will cover these drugs if there is a cardiovascular need, correct? Yeah, so that is one, in terms of the way the SELECT trial was done, it was done in people that had established cardiovascular disease, meaning like they previously had a heart attack or they had a stroke or, or some type of event like that. So yeah, it is true. Unfortunately, not everyone who has obesity would qualify for these, but you know what, it's the start. Um, and I, I think some of us are wishing, right, they had studied it in people high risk, so they would qualify. But I think, I don't think anyone expected there would be a 20% risk reduction. Like that's really quite, like that's a great risk reduction. So hopefully we're gonna get more research and um, that will make these drugs more available to people. Yeah, and well, and let's also get into this weight loss thing because mm -hmm. I know a lot of people listening, including myself, are just very interested in it and in, in that effect. And you were saying twenty percent redu uh, reduction in um, these other problems. Well, there also is about a twenty percent reduction in in weight loss, right? Or a twenty percent. So weight it's interesting. Okay. In in the trials done in people. Without diabetes, yeah, we, we have seen up to a 20% weight loss, depending on how the drugs have been studied and what type of populations and everything. In people with diabetes, usually it's a little bit less. It might be more like 10%, up to 15% sometimes, which is nothing, you know, that's nothing too shabby. It's just that it does seem like it is a little more challenging for weight loss in people with diabetes as compared to people that don't have diabetes. Okay, interesting. Would you consider these drugs revolutionary? I would. 
Um, I feel like this is just such a game changer, especially with obesity management. Before these drugs came out, we just really didn't have a lot of stuff. We had like fentramine, which is short term. It, it causes increased heart rate and increased blood pressure. And other stimulants have come and gone over the years because they ended up having bad heart effects. Uh, and then we have, I mean, we have a few others. We have like Qsimia, we have Contrave, but their weight loss, it's, I don't know, it's like six, seven, maybe you'll get 8%, a lot of non-responders to them. And so for the, they just haven't been like the game changers in weight management. So now we have drugs that really work very, very well. And overall this, I mean, everyone's different, but I would say overall the side effect profile is pretty favorable a lot of people do great with these drugs not everybody but a lot of people do do very well and in terms of long-term safety for in terms of like the heart and all that they're beneficial okay and where are we now with uh the way these drugs are administered you said that you used to have to shake it now it's once a week how are people taking these drugs yeah so they are injectables almost all of them are injectables with the exception of rebelsis which is the oral semaglutide that one is is the only pill and the reason why all most of them are injectable is just because they don't get absorbed well if you just swallow it and in fact the way rebelsis is made is that it's got the it's with this absorption enhancer to prevent it from being degraded when you swallow it, but there's a very special way it has to be taken. You actually have to take it with only up to four ounces of plain water, like no coffee, nothing else, and it has to be separated by at least 30 minutes from any other food, any other pills. And if you don't do it that way, you're it's probably not gonna get absorbed well, and you have to take it every single day. As compared to now the injectable, the weekly injectable, semaglutide, terzepatide, dulaglutide, they all come in these auto injectors that are so much easier to use. And I should like go grab mine so I can show you, but they're super easy to use. And most of them, well, I shouldn't say most of them. Some of them are like a one-time dose. The whole dose is in there. Uh, in the case of semaglutide, the Ozempic, it is click, more like a typical insulin pen, although the doses are different, but there are clicks. So the dosing, you can do multiple doses with one pen. Okay, great. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you go get your pen for our episode that's going to go on YouTube, the shorter episode oh, on kind of cool. like the history of the, the drugs and um, kind of how they work. So that, that'll be perfect. So it, go check out that video if you want to see uh, the, the pen in action. I, now I want to get into the treatment and uh, who like who's using these, why and the and kind of the results we're seeing. So let's start with patients who have diabetes and, and let's just start with type one. I, I'm very curious about type one. We really haven't covered that much yet in this conversation. You're saying that these drugs help with um, the release of insulin but I don't produce insulin. Like I have type one, I don't produce insulin. So, so how are these drugs helping people with type one? Is, is that what it's, if that, is that what it's helping with or are there other things in play? So I should specify that technically they're off label for type one, right? They're FDA approved for okay. type two diabetes. That being said, yeah, we have tons of patients with type one diabetes <laughs> that use them and greatly benefit from them. And they have been studied in smaller, some smaller studies. So like Beryl Shaw um, had done, had published a study from Barbara Davis about the use of terzepatide in type one diabetes and showed like a 10% weight loss and a 0.4% A1C reduction. So that was, that was really good to see. People always ask me, Justin, how do you keep on your diabetes technology? And it's a simple answer, skin grip. And that is why I partnered with them to sponsor today's episode. I use Skin Grip's adhesive patches to keep my Dexcom and Omnipod extra secure, especially during the humid summer, swimming, cardio workouts, and they are a must pack on all of my vacations. Whenever I notice my tech beginning to peel off, I throw on a Skin Grip and I'm set. And I look good doing it because they come in a bunch of different colors and for a more subtle look, they come in skin tone and clear options. I prefer the colors though because I match them with my outfits. 
Skin Grip has patches for all CGMs, tubeless pumps, and infusion sets. They're latex-free, hypoallergenic, and easy to apply. As a Diabetic listener, you'll get 10% off your order. To grab some for yourself, check out that link in today's show notes, or go to SkinGrip.com and use code JUSTIN10. Now, back to the show. I can tell you from my experience in, in my clinic, that people do really well. We do see glucose improvements and often we see weight loss, although not always as much as we see in the type two population. So to your question, well, how's it working if it's not causing increase in insulin? I suspect it's some of the other mechanisms like that reduced glucagon. So that could be a, a, something that is occurring even in, in people with type one, that there could be some excess glucagon um, at times, like some dysregulation that's causing excess glucose in the bloodstream. But I do suspect also the slowing of the gastric emptying can help with that reduction in that postprandial, that after eating glucose level, as well as just the appetite suppression, like the just feeling more full, maybe not eating as much. So probably, I mean, I think we expect this may have more of a benefit in someone that is overweight or has obesity but i will tell you like we've used these in people that don't have those or maybe in the past were and now aren't and they're continuing to take it and still seem to have positive impacts on postprandial glucose and weight maintenance so i in these you know what this the story didn't even start here some of these drugs have been studied in the past like liraglutide actually was studied in formal randomized controlled trials called adjunct one and adjunct two. And it showed like similar to what Viral Shaw showed. I mean, it did show an A1C reduction. Liraglutide isn't as potent. So I think there was some weight reduction, but maybe not as much. But ultimately the manufacturer Novo Nordis did not pursue taking, you know, trying to get an FDA approval. I think one of the concerns was there was increased ketosis seen. So increased ketones. Although there weren't necessarily more cases of actual diabetic ketoacidosis, but I think there was that, and there was a little bit more hypoglycemia. So that was, we do have to be weary of some of those effects. I think though, as long as you are decreasing insulin doses to go along with it, that can really prevent hypoglycemia. And if you're using it with like a hybrid closed loop system with type one, then at least you've got the system to help with the insulin suspensions. So that greatly reduces that risk. Yeah, that's super interesting. That makes sense that you'd have to basically recalibrate whatever uh, treatment you're on with your automated insulin delivery or any insulin delivery when you start a new drug, especially one like this that that's having such an effect. I did have a couple questions come up out of what you just said. One is uh, one of the effects of these drugs are that it slows down digestion. Is that what's greatly helping people with type one? You know, there's different types of foods. There's, you know, pizza and then there's chocolate cake. Chocolate cake will hit the blood sugar like boom. Um, Is this kind of making it so that that chocolate cake, that high glycemic food doesn't hit the bloodstream as quickly, therefore giving the insulin more time to like do its thing? Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting question. I do suspect that that is some of what may be occurring. Um, And then also just the increased satiety, people may be eating a little bit less at one time as well. But I do suspect that may be occurring. And I've seen often where people, they like we're changing their carb ratios, for example, like we're de-intensifying them. They may not need as much insulin with their meals as well. And especially with automated insulin delivery systems, because there's more of that wiggle room where if the food, I guess, is being digested more slowly, then you've got the background insulin that can ramp up also afterwards. So yeah, I I suspect that probably is one of the mechanisms that is, is helping. Are you having any issues with people who aren't overweight taking this drug and losing like too much weight? Yeah, I have seen that. And it's more likely to occur in older adults. So it's something we are weary of where, yeah, we don't want someone to lose too much weight. And so it's something that we need to monitor. Also, it is really important to preserve muscle mass, especially as people age. And so one of the things that I want to highlight is that these shouldn't be used in place of lifestyle changes. It's really important that people still eat healthy, eat healthy, high quality, nutritious foods. 
and that they exercise and maintain muscle mass. And that is a concern that as people are losing weight, they are losing muscle with it. And some muscle is, is expected, but we don't want a person losing a ton of their muscle mass, especially with age. So it is something we do monitor for. And if someone's losing too much weight, then we have to question, is this the right drug for them or should we back off on the dose of it? Okay, now let's get into the people that these were actually designed for, <laughs> which were type two diabetics, uh, mainly at least at, at first. How are people with type two diabetes using these drugs um, or, or why are they and what are the results we're kind of seeing? Yeah, so they, yeah, they originally got FDA approval for type two diabetes and then expanded really to weight management. So they are prominently in our guidelines and the way kind of the guidelines that we often follow are like the American Diabetes Association. Many people also look at like American Association of Clinical Endocrinology. Both guidelines are very similar in that you first ask, well, does a person have established cardiovascular disease or do they have kidney disease? In which case you want to use a GLP-1 agonist that has shown benefit in those populations. And the current ones that have that data are dulaglutide, trulicity, semaglutide, the ozempic, and liraglutide, victoza. So for those conditions, those are, are great agents to use for that. And actually more recently, semaglutide was studied in the FLOW trial. We're waiting for that to be fully published and presented, but the top line results show that it was very impressively favorable on, on kidney disease, which is really like an under like it's not talked about enough, but it's it's a complication that occurs with diabetes that now we have good treatments for and we should try to use them. Uh, but let's say someone doesn't have those conditions. Then the treatment guidelines really say, okay, we have one of two pathways to go down. Either we're focused on glucose, okay? Someone's, maybe their A1C is 9%. We wanna get them down to 7%, okay? Then we need to use an agent or agents that will get them down to that level. Or, which is actually the current statistic is 90% of people living with diabetes have also overweight or obesity. So if someone has both, then we would want to use an agent that has both of those characteristics. And the guidelines do call out specifically that semaglutide, ozempic, and terzepatide, Mounjaro, are the most effective for that dual indication. And then it kind of goes down in a hierarchy like next would be dulaglutide, liraglutide. Um, but it, it goes down like SGLT2 inhibitors will be, you know, somewhat effective. But those two are listed at the top. So I think that just speaks volumes like the guidelines are, you know, they're reinforcing what the evidence shows us. Okay. And, and were you saying 90% uh, of people with type 2 diabetes tend to be overweight so or is it all like all diabetes? So the statistic I have is from the NHANES data, which technically combines type one and type two, but of course type one is only five to 10% of that number. So there are less people with type one living with overweight or obesity for sure. It, in terms of with type two, it's more aligned, but the reality is I think like 70% of Americans have overweight or obesity now and so yeah. people with type 1 also like around 70 percent also live with it so it's still a high number but it is not as high as type 2 diabetes well and that statistic you said which is around like 70 percent of people in the u.s are, are are overweight in some way i mean that just shows why this could be such a revolutionary drug and, and why it has caught fire let's get into kind of the weight loss use how is it being used for weight loss? Um, like, it, it, when did that? When did it gain in popularity, too? Well, I think movie stars started using it and posting on TikTok, and people saw that <laughs> and they were like, "Oh, <laughs> how do I get some of that?" Uh, it it has though. There's good data to support its use. So, in terms of the clinical studies. They, they've they been studied in people that have a body mass index over 30, which is considered obesity technically, even though a lot of people would argue that BMI is not a great indicator and someone with a lot of muscle could have a BMI of 30 and be healthier. Um, but generally that's how they're studied or someone with a, a slightly lower BMI of like 27 that has maybe high blood pressure, high cholesterol or diabetes. 
Um, so, but they've been studied to show that they're effective at, at causing weight loss, and this has led to indications. So, specifically for liraglutide, which um, the weight loss version of that drug is Sixenda, and a slightly higher dose compared to the diabetes version, Victoza as well as for semaglutide, the weight loss versions, we go V and that's a slightly higher dose as well. And then now Zepbound, which is actually the same dose as the diabetes version. So they all have FDA approved indications. Now the challenge is with the FDA approved indications, it is easier for a doctor or a healthcare provider to prescribe it. The coverage piece though, has really been the challenge. They are expensive drugs. And so we're seeing the coverage for type two diabetes has been very good, I would say overall, and has dramatically expanded in line with what the guidelines say we should be doing. But when you just look at the treatment of weight management, I think there's been a lot of hesitancy from insurance plans to cover it because of the 70% of people that are eligible for it and what that would do to our healthcare system and our finances and our taxes if everyone who is eligible for it actually received it. And so I think that's where some of the challenges lie. Yeah. Hearing that makes me just, <laughs> I hate how our society doesn't create drugs and treatments just for like the common good. <laughs> Like, I just wish that, like, we as a society found a great drug that helps people and we're like, we're going to give this to everyone who needs it. Like, that's just not how society works, at least in the U.S. Um, but I don't think it works like that everywhere either, um, even people with, you know, full um, universal health care. But I don't know that that just like is that feeling. That's the feeling I got instantly as you kind of said that, uh, that I just had to kind of blurt that <laughs> blurt that out. Well, um, it's just, right, it comes down to the cost of it. And so... Yeah, it's a lot of money. It is a lot of money. And I mean, I get it, right? The manufacturers, need, they've put a lot of research into it and they needed to do that to get FDA approval and show its benefits. And so they, they do need to recoup some of that money. But at the same time, it's like you wonder, yeah. does it need to cost over $1,000 a month? And isn't there something we could do to make it more accessible to people? Yeah, I have some more questions and thoughts and information that I want to bring up later in that area. We're going we're to dive a little deeper into coverage in just a bit, but I, I do want to stick with where we are where we are now, which is as you were kind of saying, like when to go back to the type two diabetes, like it, are these drugs helping reverse type two diabetes? Because type two diabetes can be reversible, right? With the right diet and exercises, are these drugs able to like? be part of that solution? Well, I think it's how you look at it. So the thought is that type two diabetes is considered a chronic condition. Once you have it, you have it, but you can put it into remission. And so, yeah, okay. you make a lot of lifestyle changes. You can get your A1C to below 5.7%. And so 5.7 is kind of that cutoff we consider pre-diabetes. And so if you get it below that, then technically like that's remission. You don't have a diabetes like a1c level uh so definitely these drugs can help get there and we look at the data a, a higher percentage of people are, are able to get those a1c's under that level i think where some of the controversy comes in is when you look at different definitions of remission some of the definitions say well you can't be on a drug to call it remission if you're taking a drug then it's not considered mm -hmm. remission but if you're not taking the drug then it's remission i mean in my mind if you get those outcomes, like who cares if you're taking a drug or not taking a drug, like you've achieved those outcomes and you're in remission and you're gonna have better chance of not having complications from diabetes. And that ultimately is the goal. And so I think it's exciting to see that because even though we've historically had goals for people like, okay, your A1C should be under seven or maybe under 6.5, the reality is those are not magic numbers. It's not like you hit seven or 7.1 and boom, you're now going to have kidney disease. It just doesn't work that way. Like it's kind of an, you have increased risk. You could have increased risk at 6.1%, 6.2%. Like it's a little bit different for everybody. But the point is, if you can safely lower that, then you're going to probably have the best chance of hopefully not having diabetes complications. Okay. What happens when people stop taking it? 
does it always mean that they'll go back to square one or are some people like they do it for a year and then they're, they're able to kind of continue that path with this new routine or outlook? Like what are we seeing there? So I think it's important for people to know when they're having the conversation about, should I start this or not, that these are meant to be chronic medications. Just like typically when you start a medication for your blood pressure or your cholesterol, they are typically chronic medications. It's not like, boom, you get it to goal and then you stop it. It's not like an antibiotic, like you fix the problem and you get to stop. So there is always going to be a risk that if you stop it, or what I worry about is people don't have access, there's a shortage or they can't afford it anymore. Most likely there's going to be weight rebound and definitely for someone using it to to manage their glucose levels, the likely those glucose levels are going to go up. And so that is very concerning about it. Now, there are some strategies that can be done for sure. We want to use this in conjunction with lifestyle changes. And so if someone can really use those appetite effects to learn to follow their hunger cues and try to eat in a healthier way and eat smaller portions, I think some of that can carry through even with a reduced dose or with stopping the drug. And for sure, there's some people that have been able to stop it or reduce the dose and maintain a good amount of weight loss. They may regain some, but a lot of people, and there's been studies to show this, that where they kept half the people on the drug and took half the people off the drug, the ones they took off the drug, like almost always their weight creeps up to where they started. And that's really not a healthy pattern. Unfortunately, this yo-yoing is like a common American pattern. People like go on a diet, they lose weight, they then they go off the wagon and they gain it. And that, that's not good. And then it makes it so hard the next time to lose any weight. Now, what about side effects? There's this, this can't just be perfect, right? Right. So they do have side effects. And I think sometimes these get like blown up on the internet. But the most common side effects are really what we call gastrointestinal. So um, stomach things, basically, like feeling nauseous is really common, especially with the first dose, super common or anytime you're increasing the dose. If nausea gets bad enough, that can lead to vomiting. The other extremely common side effect, I would say, is diarrhea but some people actually experience constipation so it can go both ways the thing is there's a lot we can do in terms of education to try so a person doesn't have these side effects and a a big one is just that you eat more slowly you try to stop eating when you're full and also trying to avoid like really high fat very spicy foods if you can follow those often that just helps a ton with the nausea and it's also the reason that we do start with lower doses and then gradually go up and so in cases where i mean unfortunately i see cases where people are just automatically prescribed like the highest dose or a higher dose and so yeah it's not surprising they're having a ton of side effects so that's like something to to be aware of Now, there are some less common things that sound more alarming. And probably the big one is there is a black box warning for thyroid C-cell tumors. And that sounds, wow, super scary. And what happens is, or what has happened is when given very high doses to rodents, they've seen these thyroid C-cell tumors. The thing to understand is this is a very rare form of thyroid cancer, and it's a highly genetic form of thyroid cancer. So usually someone can be tested to find out if they are a carrier for it and if they have a family history of it. And in those cases, we don't use it because we just don't know. Maybe it's just in mice, but we don't want to take the chance. So that's why there's a black box warning on that. But I think I've seen that get misconstrued online where people just hear the word thyroid and they're like, oh, it's so bad. Like it's gonna ruin your thyroid or you have any thyroid condition and it's a problem. And that is not the case. Like there's actually, this is a very rare form of thyroid cancer. All the other forms of thyroid cancer, there's no like issue taking it and and just simply maybe having a slow thyroid and taking levothyroxine, like it's not an issue. So that's one big thing. And then the second big one I wanna say is just the pancreatitis is probably the other like big one you hear about. The thing to know with pancreatitis, there have been case reports, so I'm not denying that in any way. Uh, But we also know that people with diabetes have higher risk of pancreatitis. And so the exact causation, like we just don't know. The thing is you give a drug to a gazillion people 
you don't always know they develop something. Is it because of the drug? Is it just because they had other risk factors? That being said, we don't want to take the risk. So if someone has chronic pancreatitis, like we should, probably shouldn't use it in them. Um, so those are like the big things I would say. Otherwise, like it, it generally is like every drug will have some side effects or can, but it's generally pretty well tolerated. Do these drugs work for everyone or are there some people that they try it and, and they have they don't get the results? So they actually don't work for everyone. I know it seems that way because of like all the hype and everything and they do work for most, but they don't work for everyone. And so an example is like a lot of these clinical trials, when you look at it, one of the markers they'll look at is like, okay, what percentage of people lost 5% of their body weight and what percent lost 10 and 15 and so on. And even when you kind of 5% is that sweet spot, like if someone's responding, they, they probably should lose 5% or more. And it, a lot of times it's like 90%, maybe a, a little more. So that to me means like almost 10% of people in some way didn't respond or didn't have at least 5% of weight loss. And so for sure we see non-responders and I don't think we understand or know why they're not responding. I will say like I have had some patients that they're just so steadily gaining weight that sometimes it's a win just to put that on pause. And if they stop gaining weight, even if they haven't lost weight, like sometimes that's still a win. But yeah, it's unclear why some people could have a really profound weight loss of 25% or more, and then another person can't even lose 5% weight loss from these agents. You know, you've listed so many ways that these drugs can help people, but one thing we haven't really talked about was people's mental health, depression, anxiety. You, I can imagine that people's weight and their outlook of themselves because of that could potentially affect their mental health. Like, are we seeing increased mental health with, with, with people on these drugs? Well, there were some reports of increased like suicide or suicidal ideation with some of these drugs. I mean, it's really unclear if wow. it's, there's, the FDA investigated it and did not find a direct correlation. But okay. I think that for someone that really struggles with mental health and maybe be thinking, well, if I just lose weight, like I'll be happy. And then realizes mm -hmm. losing weight was not, like that was not the source of being happy or sad. I could see how that could, you know, that, that could worsen it. I think there's definitely, we eat, people eat for a variety of reasons. It happens to be in the case of, for sure, for type two diabetes, there's a lot of dysregulation and people don't recognize they're full. But people also eat out of a lot of emotions. Some people eat, they're, they're angry, they're sad, they're just stressed out. And so some of that, even if you have something helping with your appetite, there may still just be that desire to wanna eat. And in fact, if that hunger goes away, that could be depressing because eating was a source of joy. And if you're not ever hungry now to eat, that could definitely affect mood. And so I think it's really important. Like I know we're very fortunate in our center. We have social workers and we have psychologists and that like those people are really important to have because diabetes alone already, there's like a big, there could be a very big mental health burden there. And then you add this like layer of food and how these drugs are impacting the food. And so it is really, it is very important to be addressing that. Yeah. Let's, let's get into coverage. Uh, how easy or difficult is it for people who, who want this drug to get this drug or these drugs? So it all depends on your insurance uh, and how much money you have, <laughs> unfortunately. So we know there's a lot of health inequities in the world and in the US. And so it is very dependent on what type of insurance plan someone has. Like I know in the state of Ohio, someone's got Medicaid. They're not getting Mount Jaro, at least not at first. Um, they'll probably have to try lots of things before we can convince their mm -hmm. plan that they should be able to try Mount Jaro. Uh, so it, it does depend a lot on that. I will say that for people that have cardiovascular disease and type two diabetes, that it has gotten a lot easier now to obtain these drugs. Uh, for other things though, like just for type two diabetes, often, people may have to try something else. So metformin has historically kind of been a first line drug and it is a whole lot cheaper. It's a drug that like often can be obtained for $4 a month. It's generic. 
And so often people have to show that they've tried that drug, they've taken the maximum dose of it before they can get this agent. And sometimes, I mean, my own employee health plan, you also have to show that you have like an A1C over 7% and that you've tried a different drug class, the SGLT2 inhibitors, and then you can get this drug. So it, sometimes there's just all these hoops and then they always require a prior authorization. So it's not like a doctor can just prescribe it and you go to the pharmacy and get it. I mean, sometimes, but very rarely, usually someone behind the scenes has to do some additional paperwork and say, okay. this is why this person is worthy of having this drug. And so these are barriers. And the other thing is even when insurance covers it, that doesn't always mean it's affordable. And affordability is different for different people. Um, some insurance plans could say, well, it's a, a $1,000 or $1,100 monthly drug, and we've taken it down to $300 a month for you. And the person may say, okay, that is something I'm willing to pay. Um, but I have some patients where their insurance plan it says it's $100 a month, and I'm thinking that's a bargain compared to a thousand, but they say to me, I don't have an extra $100 a month just laying around to ob obtain this drug. So it's really, that's a challenge right there. And then the other thing that has thrown a whole wrench into this is just with the drug shortages now that sometimes mm. like the dose you need isn't even available. And so it's like, it's approved, but then the person can't get it. And then you have to decide well, are we gonna go to a different dose? Are we gonna switch to a different one in this class? And so there's there's for sure, there's a bunch of challenges. Okay, I have a couple questions coming from that. So like, was this always the case with these drugs that they were so difficult to get, you needed all these authorizations? Or did that happen because of their popularity? And is this how all drugs start when they, when they, you know, when they have a big impact? So I think the increased popularity has definitely, it's it definitely affected the shortages. And I think also it's affected probably a little bit of the prior authorization process. But the thing is, we're just seeing prior authorizations now are required for pretty much like every brand name drug. Like it's just gotten out of control. There's, there's just so much kind of behind the scenes paperwork that makes it a challenge. Um, one thing I will say is there are there is something called patient assistance programs where for people that qualify and like in the case of like, for example, I'll give you an example. Novo Nordisk has one for semaglutide and they, theirs is 400 percent of the federal poverty level, which is actually pretty good. Like depending on your family size, a lot of people qualify for that. And so that is a way for someone that can't afford it or doesn't have insurance or doesn't have a coverage for it that they can't obtain it. But we have seen because of these shortages, other companies don't have these patient assistance programs available, which has been a challenge because we do rely heavily on those for people that can't afford them. Are people lying to get covered for these, do you think? So I, I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that are <laughs> saying, they like, they'll have prediabetes, they'll say, just, I need, I wanna have type two diabetes so I can get it. <laughs> And that's like something that's ne <laughs> never happened before. So there is definitely that push for it. Now, I, I hope people aren't lying. I mean, because healthcare providers, like, you know, we signed an oath, like we, we shouldn't be lying and things. But I do think that there's some maybe re le le like, let's recheck or like, let's do an oral glucose tolerance test and see if maybe you really do meet the criteria for type two diabetes. So I think there there is some of that people are wanting the diagnosis so that they can get it, which is like, yeah, it's just crazy. Uh, people are reporting that they're paying $300 a month for these drugs after insurance, mm -hmm. that these drugs often have a 20 to 50% copay. What have you kind of been seeing uh, when it comes to price and coverage? Uh, let's Let's start with the U.S. Well, we do. So for people that have commercial insurance plans, like meaning they're not on a government plan, they're not on Medicaid or Medicare, they generally may get insurance maybe through their employer or the marketplace. 
there are manufacturer copay cards that like Lily, Novo, they, they produce. And so I think a lot of people don't know about those. So it's always a good idea to check online first to see if there's a copay card that could be utilized. And often that will take, if, if the insurance plan covers it, that will help bring it down further, usually to something maybe like $25 or $50 a month. So that is something people should definitely try to do. That being said, I think Medicare is really tough. Um, Medicaid is tough too with coverage, but usually once it is covered, it's covered and a person doesn't necessarily have a copay. But Medicare is where there's like 5 million plans. None of them are eligible for the government or because they're government, none of them are eligible for copay cards. And so they are kind of at the mercy of like what their deductible is, what their, they, they're the ones that may have these higher copays. And it's really, it's unfortunate because we know these drugs could have a really good benefit on them, but we end up not being able to use them. And we have to use older drugs like sulfonylureas. And just going back, because I don't think I stress this enough, but in terms of benefits, I mean, I have seen my patients with type 2 diabetes come off of insulin, like being on four shots a day and just coming off of it. Or what's more common is maybe someone's on four shots a day, but they get to come off of their mealtime insulin. So they're taking one shot a day instead of four a day. And so like when you think about quality of life and like how we've made it easier for them, um, and they're also not like jumping around and their glucose isn't up and down and on a roller coaster. Like, it's so nice to be able to do that for someone. Like people are, they, I don't know, they're so happy. Like, I'm like, all I did was help you get this drug, but they're like so happy about it. So it's just really nice to see those benefits, but unfortunately we're just not able to get it for everyone that would benefit from it. Yeah. A, a recent study from Yale said that it takes less than $5 to manufacture Ozempic. And, you know, this can cost Americans upwards of $1,000 a month. I know that there's a lot behind pricing. And it's not as simple as it costs this much to make and then we're going to charge this much. There is so much R&D. It is extremely expensive from what I've been learning to get something approved by the FDA, the, the, the three phases to get a drug um, cleared and how many drugs don't even go through all, 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 uh, all the phases. And I've heard that sometimes a drug company could make, could come up with 10 drugs, but it, but only one of them actually works and is their Ozempic. What do you, what do you think pharma would say? Um, I mean, I'm sure they came out with a response, but what do you think is the reasoning, I guess, behind you know, it being so inexpensive to produce, yet it's so expensive. Yeah, so I don't know that it's as cheap as $5 a day, but I do know that there are a number of compounding pharmacies that are able to get like the pure semaglutide, for example, or terzepatide or whatever other molecules, and they reconstitute it, they compound it in their own way, and they're able to sell it for a lower cost. And so for sure, it. I'm sure it doesn't cost a thousand or you know dollars to make per month. But to your point, there is all of that stuff that's going on in the background and all of those clinical studies. And also thinking about the device that's administered in as well. The devices are designed to be just a really safe and effective and easy way to administer it as opposed to when it is compounded and maybe it's coming out of a vial and a syringe, that just creates kind of an extra layer of potential safety issues and things are misdosing. So I, I think some of it comes into that. But that being said, when you compare to prices around the world, I mean, I've been to other countries where these drugs are sold for three or four hundred dollars a month, which is still a high cost, but that's like a third of the cost that it is in the U.S. So it does seem like the U.S. kind of puts up the bill for the rest of the world. And so you kind of wonder, is there a way to maybe spread that out a little bit more to so that we're not the ones, you know, and we can make it more accessible to everyone that would benefit from it. So I don't have the answers for that, um, but I know that it's just, it's a complicated system. Also, there are all of the middlemen too. So with the whole supply chain, right? Like these are dispensed in pharmacies, there's pharmacy benefit managers 
that are negotiating prices with the insurance plans and the manufacturers and giving payment to the pharmacies. One of the undiscussed things is that you would think the pharmacies dispensing these drugs are making some money, right? Like they have to take time to check for drug interactions and make sure it's a safe dose. Like they don't need a lot, but they should get something. Well, the way these negotiations work out, sometimes they lose money. They dispense it and they actually lose money on it, especially independent pharmacies. So there's wow. like all of this, <laughs> these things behind the scenes that are like not functioning optimally that really need to be fixed. And I don't know what the answer is. I mean, do we ask government to come and step in and like put their foot down and say, this is what it needs to be or some other way, but it's definitely not functioning perfectly right now. Yeah, I mean, I do think we can use a little government. Uh, I was listening to this podcast. It's called Acquired. They did a four-hour special on Novo Nordisk all the way from the beginning and how it was. there was a company called Nordisk and then a new company called Novo came out and then it eventually became Novo Nordisk. Anyway, get they get into a Zempic and they mention, and everyone who's listening to this should listen to that. It's amazing. I'll put it in the description. Um, they said that there are six middlemen between the consumer, the patient, and the and pharma so it is not like i i think from everything i've learned recently it is not always pharma's fault right for why prices are so expensive they are trying to make drugs i mean of course we want to cure but they are trying to make drugs and make are making drugs that are to help people they want accessibility the more accessibility the more money they can ultimately make and the more people they can help and it's good people who want to help people but there are six people. I'm sorry. If there are six people negotiating, we are not getting a fair price. Right. Yeah, it's crazy to me. I totally agree. So, <laughs> we need change, um, and maybe someone will hear this podcast and, and they'll go. They'll go do, make some change. But also, Thanks. I worry about uh, yeah. like if you think about insulin. So, insulin in some way, we've had the government step in and say, okay, for at least for people with Medicare, like they shouldn't have to pay more than thirty five dollars a month for their insulin. Great. Like that seems good, right? It, it helps people access a life-saving medication. Well, now there's a shortage. <laughs> there's a shortage of insulin Lispro vials and then Levomir's being discontinued. And so you have to wonder what is the indirect impact of that? Because if a company is gonna lose money on making a drug, I mean, they're gonna be pretty disincentivized to focus on that. So I think like, it's just, it is really complicated. Well, that that's literally my next question, which is one thing that worries me as someone with type one is that drugs like Ozempic, Wagovi, Manjaro, they're all so big, they are big money makers for these companies. Why do they, or should they, I mean, obviously they should, but why do they even care about people with type one? We are such a small market to them. We have insulin, it's there. Do they have any incentive to make insulin faster than it is? We have ultra rapid, but it's not great. It could be better. Like, are they gonna put any R&D? Are they putting R&D toward better insulins for people with type one who can really use it? Well, it's a good point. And I think that what helps them put some R&D behind it is the fact that a lot of people, because you're right, type one is a smaller subset of the whole population with diabetes, but a lot of people with type two still need insulin to really reach their, their goals. So there still is a larger number of people that need it. That being said, yeah, I worry that if it's gonna be so heavily regulated to the point where every insulin would have kind of this this max price, then there probably wouldn't be an incentive to focus on trying to innovate with insulin. So I'm hopeful that at least with new insulins, I mean, it's a reason that they do need to have some patent exclusivity and need to be able to sell it for a little bit of a higher price. And there is, hopefully there's gonna be a weekly insulin available soon. So that's an innovation, perhaps maybe more for type two, but I'm hopeful that the innovation for the more rapid acting insulin is not going away. It, because I agree, that is really a need. And if we're ever going to really, I think, close the loop and increase time and range, um, especially time in tighter range, that 70 to 140, the missing piece of all of this is we do need faster insulin that's more physiologic, that truly acts more like insulin in a person 
without diabetes. So like a person without diabetes, they start eating. I mean, they even look at their food. They start salivating. Their insulin is already it's already <laughs> coming up in higher numbers and it's out of the system so quickly so they don't go low. But all of our insulins, even our rapid acting insulins, don't, just don't work that way. They hang out for too long and yeah. they, they can lead to lows. It's very hard. Yeah, and that, that weekly insulin that you mentioned, that would be a long acting insulin, which for type twos, uh, very useful. And then for people who are um, MDI, multiple daily injections, a weekly long acting insulin could be very helpful uh, for, for people. And, you know, the one innovation I'm really want to seeing, want, really wanting to see when it comes to insulin for, uh, especially for people with type one, I guess it could be for everyone is um, smart insulin, which uh, it, it isn't, it, people are looking into it. They are, re, they're researching it, which it would basically be an injection. I'm not, it may be a day, maybe once a week where you inject this insulin, but it's smart. It will only activate when needed and could re, could truly be essentially like a cure to type to, to, to diabetes management. Um, not a cure because you still have to take it, which we learned earlier. Uh, but I, I would really like to see that. And, you know, I was really gunning for these companies to do that. And there's just this gut feeling of like, there's not money. There's no money in it. Why not just continue to make these other drugs? Um, you know, well, it's interesting. More. Well, yes, that glucose sensitive insulin. I mean, that would be the key, because if that worked in the way it's supposed to, we wouldn't even need necessarily all this technology. Like, I don't know that we would need automatic insulin delivery systems because the insulin would work so well. And so you do kind of wonder, like the implications of all these other companies then that are making these products and how it would impact them. So in terms of innovation, I don't know, it might need to be the government funding that really helps with this type of research, because you're right, like it, it would put a lot of companies totally out of business if that insulin really worked in the way that it possibly could. Yeah. And a lot of, you know, a lot of these companies are saying that, you know, they're, they're, they are full of good people. I've met so many good people at Insulate, Dexcom, Medtronic, wherever that have people that are that cure, that truly want a cure. So I would hope that, you know, some of these people put the, the money aside and, and, you know, want want that cure to come and or want that really, you know, that smart insulin to come. So um, there's obviously there's so much to look forward to. Um, with insulin, I hope, uh, and I hope that these companies don't, you know, don't forget about us. Uh, but thank you so much, Diana. This was, um, this was so interesting. I learned so much. There was so much I still wanted to learn about these drugs, and, and I'm glad that everyone listening, uh, whether you have type one, type two, or are looking into like weight loss as an option, that you learned something um, about this too. So thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Really, really happy to be here. Have you used these drugs or are you considering it? Let us know in the comments so we can hear your story and stay tuned for the continuation of this conversation, which is dropping on YouTube this Friday. For a behind the scenes look at my videos, input on future content and direct messaging with me, check out my Patreon. You can get all of that for the price of a latte. And if you want to support the show for free, consider giving it a review on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Episodes of this podcast release every Monday wherever you listen and on YouTube. I've got links to my YouTube channel and social media accounts in the show notes. I'm Justin, and I'll see you next week.